Good morning. This is an introduction to what you're about to see. If you have patience to get through it, um, in respect to the platform of these kind of videos, uh, this is like a big one. This is like a 25 minute or so uh, video. And uh, just to give you a preview, uh, it's a treatment of Psalm 32. It is um, a picture of turning to the Lord for maybe the first time. And that's kind of what motivated me this morning is uh, I woke up and thought about um, the people of Israel waking up the first morning out of Egypt and they woke up and there was bread on the ground and uh, they asked, what is this? And sometimes there's a lot of people out there struggling with um, what they do for a living and how, how they buy bread. And, uh, you know, to bring it back to a deeper level, you know, what is, what is your purpose in life? What motivates you to get up in the morning? And uh, sometimes it is bread. And the meaning of the word bread in that passage in Exodus is, uh, what is this? So if you're wondering what your purpose is, if you're wondering um, what is born into your very nature, um, maybe this is for you. And if you've never heard a good news presentation of uh, the protection that the Lord offers you and uh, the uh, battles that you have in life, you have a refuge there in and a God that you can't see. So if that makes you curious, keep on listening to the long form of this. And uh, I hope you're blessed and have a awesome day. I woke up this morning and, you know, I've, I've been uh, listening to Ken Coleman and, and uh, 47 years old and, uh, been thinking a lot about the purpose that we have in life and uh, you know I've been a minister I've been a missionary and I've gotten my favorite cars in life um, I've got a wonderful wife wonderful family and uh, you know b basically what more is there to accomplish <laughs> you know um, so I woke up this morning and said what is the greatest need and a lot of times when we're talking about purpose-driven life, you, you use the language of what gets you up in the morning. And uh, one of the things that um, a lot of people are motivated by, uh, the Proverbs say that a, a man is motivated by hunger. The worker is motivated by the hunger that drives him. And so... Uh, when I woke up this morning, um, I, I didn't have a job to go to this morning. Um, that's for tomorrow. But, uh, you know, I was thinking the greatest need that anybody has is is the need for the awareness of, of a Savior. And sure enough, um, <laughs> the Lord showed me the way to uh, to figure out uh, what needs to be done today. And this is it right here. Um, if you, if, if you know the story of, uh, of the Exodus, uh, yesterday I was reading that story in Exodus, uh, 15 or so where, where they're coming out of, of Egypt. And when they find themselves wandering in the desert, uh, the bread, their bread for the day, they called it manna. And the meaning of the word manna is what is this? What is it? And, and so it's, it's been an encouragement to my heart today because um, when, when I consider purpose in life and what am I going to do uh, with my time and, uh, you know, you think, what am I going to do to earn a living today? What am I going to do to buy bread today? And, uh, you know, when we are in Christ, uh, we are to make the things that we do with our hands, the things that are the work of God. And so, you know, the struggle that I have is to, uh, 
go into that place where you ask the Lord every day, what is it? <laughs> What's the bread? <laughs> and uh, that, that's kind of where I have been. But he gave me an answer. And uh, th this is mainly for uh, people who have never understood that it is God who is your Savior. And uh, I want you to follow me with this because uh, this is applicable to you. And um, it's, it's not just some religious guy spitting it out to you that has something to gain from you making a decision to uh, follow God or to acknowledge him. Um, it is completely having to do with, with what is good for you and uh, what is right and what is good and what can definitely change your life. Um, one, one passage that I want to point out is uh, Psalm 32. And uh, if you jump there in the middle, um, Psalm 32, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. And, you know, a lot of people who come and go with considering God, um, you know, might have a problem with the fact that God may be lost at some point or another. And uh, factually, it's not God who gets lost. It's that um, we are the ones that are lost. If, if we don't acknowledge who God is and even go for understanding his ways, then we're the ones that are lost. And I do believe that God, um, there's a Jewish belief that, that God is hidden. And, um, and I believe there's a lot, a lot of truth to that because um, if you don't see God, you don't see God. God is not visible, but his, his attributes are, are visible, his faithfulness, his, his steadfast love. Uh, there's evidence of it all around. Something that's happening in our contemporary world these days is that Kanye West has turned to, to the Lord, and I don't know what you believe about that, but this is what I see. I see the look on that man's face is pure joy that did not come from having a beautiful wife and a wonderful family or wealth or fame because he's gone down that path before and that didn't give him that joy. What gave him that joy was when he turned his heart to God and uh, he started proclaiming with his mouth that Jesus is Lord. And uh, you can see it. It's evidence. And I think it's a beautiful thing. I think it's wonderful. Um, but I want to walk you through this um, because I think that the scripture just lays it open so cool. And um, and I was thinking about it from a person who didn't necessarily walk with God and everything is it's kind of like contained right here in Psalm 32. It says, um, it says, offer prayer uh, to you, God, in a time that you may be found. And, and then... I was thinking, I was also reading uh, today about the, the kingdom of God, or sorry, the kingdom of David that is a, a parable of the kingdom of God, just like just like wandering in the desert is, is a parable of the way that we have to seek the bread of God today. And, and so I can ask that, that question, what is it, the same way we can say, how is my journey today, like David uh, winning over the kingdom because it was an advancing kingdom. It was won little by little, battle by battle, and they always counted upon God. And that's where this passage comes in. It was one, one of the times where he had uh, willfully sinned and um, his confession, <clears throat> acknowledgement of that sin is what got him back on the right track because the, the kingdom had been given to him and, you know, God was testing his faithfulness. Is he going to be a man after my own heart or is he going to go for what he desires? And when you read through this passage, um, that there is an acknowledgement of God that is necessary. That is just a, a requirement. 
And the reason it's a requirement is not because some religious guy said, hey, it's a requirement. It's not even because God said this is a requirement. But this is, this is what I see. It says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. And if you've been around Bible passages at all, the way you should go, you've probably heard this before in parenting and or the, in the Proverbs say, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And uh, the way he should go, interestingly enough, in that passage uh, is talking about the uh, bridle that a horse has. And in this passage right here points it out too. It says, be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with a bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. Now, in this container of, of a passage here, it says that, that there is a, a meaning and a purpose that a horse has, even though he also has his own will. And if the horse is smart, he's going to do what his master says. Otherwise, he's going to be forced to do what his master says by a bit and bridle. And um, I think this is this is what's cool about this to me, it, is that there is something inherent in this passage that tells you that there is some kind of an order in creation. The order in creation is that mankind is the top of creation. In the state of, what is it, South Carolina? And in some places out west, there are examples of horses living their whole lives in the wild, doing what they want to do, running around and uh, doing what horses do. But there's something about mankind that has looked at the horse and said, what was that horse made for? What's it good to do? What does it like doing? It likes pulling stuff. It's a strong animal. It's bigger than man. And man has learned through industry to uh, bridle the power of a horse and put it to work. And, uh, and it ha we've done that with every other creature. Uh, we've asked the question for it. What's it designed for? What, <clears throat> excuse me. What are they designed for? What are they useful for? Um, what are the things that they can do? What are the what are this animal's strengths and abilities? And instead of having the animals just run wild and do whatever they want, sometimes we've learned to uh, use their strengths and abilities uh, to uh, increase our livability or, or somehow to do something good for for others. And so, but the but the question is. Uh, or what it shows a bigger picture of is that there are purposes that are inherently born into a creature. So, um, you know, a, 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 uh, I, I live in Alaska and there are people who harness the power of dogs to uh, pull themselves for transportation across the frozen tundra. And so... Uh, but they don't do that with ravens. They don't do that with um, with other birds because birds aren't good for pulling stuff. Um, so it, it begs the question that, well, it, it shows, it displays that every creature has its own purpose. And so um, even, even without considering what is the purpose of mankind, you can see that everything has a purpose and that Man is kind of on the top of that that food chain, so to speak, because of our intelligence. So it also it brings us to that cusp of of decision to say, is there really a God? Is there a uh, something above this creation that has made all those things to be? And when you look at other people, you can see that we have characteristics that are in common but 
but you know, we, we have different varying levels of intelligence. We have different varying levels of strength. And so people are very different, but we, um, have the same basic features and functions. These differences that we have between mankind is th this, the sensitive spot is, is that there are good and bad. Um, if you want to put it in another characteristic between good and bad, it's there's wise and then there's foolish. And uh, so verse 10 says, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the ones who trust in the Lord. So if you want to put it, this, this uh, separator is people who live in love and people who live in sorrow. And uh, the people who follow God and the people who are wicked. And, um, and and I know that there's a lot of lines that are crossed sometimes as we observe as humans. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of approaching this from if you've never heard the gospel before, if you've never uh, acknowledged God, that, that there, there's a lot of reason to uh, do so because... You know, just just like if you're walking in a in an area of town that you, that you don't that, you know that you're trying to protect your uh, own body and own safety and security. There's people in places that you don't go, and then there's people that you might feel safe with. Um, so, but what I'm what I want to get at is is it's not judgment. It's not looking at other people that determine that it is it is the decision that people make in their own hearts as to which direction and path that they want to go and um, it's again it's built into this passage this one passage in psalm 32 here that um if if you want to go your own way if you don't want to acknowledge god then you'll be living in sorrow and, you know, your outcome will, will generally uh, become wickedness because if you don't acknowledge God, if you don't acknowledge that there's somebody who has a, a say or a, a stake in the behavior that, that we have, just like we as, you know, if you own a horse, you have a stake in how that horse behaves. Like, like if, if, if you jump, jump animals, you know, work animals, if you have a cow who has a set of horns on his head, you have a stake in whether he gores you or don't gore you. <laughs> and, and you also have a responsibility. If, if you know that that animal gores, then you better keep them away from other people or you will be responsible. So the responsibility we have as caretakers of other creatures um, we have to acknowledge that somebody has care that they take over us and this is a god we you, you don't have to understand anything more than that to acknowledge that there is a caretaker and um, this is the place where joy and righteousness and uprightness and gladness is that's verse 11. So just acknowledging God is to acknowledge that he has care that he has for me, for, for you, and, and that it matters and it's important and that your path, your, your happiness and determination of life will be affected by the, just your acknowledgement. Now, now you go back to the first part of this passage. Uh, we know that the guy who wrote this passage acknowledged God somehow, but he also gives us a glimpse into a picture of a time when you did not. And this is exactly what he's saying. He's saying, I've, I know who God is, but I didn't acknowledge that I was wrong about anything. And this is where it, it describes that, that his life was miserable. He couldn't, couldn't stand to be alive. He said, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through groaning all day long. 
for and and my strength was dried up by the heat of summer and uh but then there's a turning point the turning point is am i going to acknowledge that there's a caretaker who cares whether i am doing well or doing evil towards myself and towards others and once you cross that line to where you acknowledge that there is a caretaker above you um, you can easily more easily uh, push that acknowledge that sin put it out there in words and and to uh, ask your caretaker to take take the guilt of it away take the penalty of it away and it says i, I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And it says, uh, so what does that mean? What does that mean for us? I, I was thinking today, uh, as I was entering into this passage, it said that uh, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance because there's something vulnerable about the state of mankind. Uh, we all have a need for, um, for security and safety because um, when you go back to the David and, and the kingdom, he was constantly fighting. He was constantly in battle. He was constantly under somebody else's um, evil influence, if you want to put it that way, they were always trying to harm him. And this is, this is the way that we live every day. Somebody's after you, somebody is, is coming after you. And how are you going to protect yourself? And the whole point is, is that, uh, he wasn't lifting his hands to protect himself but he was looking in his in in the depth of his soul to be protected by his caretaker and that is the state of us all is is to acknowledge our sins before god and and allow him to be our refuge and once that is in place then you can carry on with your day and uh you can wake up and and when once you acknowledge that that he is your caretaker and that that he will take care of you even though you don't even know what it is uh that that is the kind of god he is and it says steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the lord be glad in the lord and rejoice O righteous and shout for joy all you upright of heart so um so we have a choice of what we acknowledge with our minds and how, which direction our hearts are going to turn. And, um, you know, when it comes down to is, is you can live, um, uh, in sorrow or you can choose joy. And, um, that's, that's the way I want to go. That's the route I want to take. And, uh, it, if you never heard it before, then it might be a brand new thing. So, uh, you got to hear it the first time. So, uh, today when, when I woke up, um, I guess the Lord laid it on my heart. He was my teacher today. He told me that, that, uh, you know, th through the word and through wisdom and through knowing who he is, he said, uh, that the need for a savior is what he wants to advertise today what the the message that he wants to get out there uh, that is the work that needs to be done that is that is his work just like uh, jesus did the work of the lord um, so that is my that is my work today that is the work of the lord today to uh, announce that that the lord is your caretaker and uh, he he has a life of goodness for you and that uh, there is evidence of turning to him and that uh, that place is not free from conflict but it is uh, 
not made in a it is not left in a vulnerable place where um, there is no protection because he is our protector he is our strength he is our joy so uh, let that be our way to be today <laughs>